te hau, ke te uru, whakataka te hau, ke te tanga. Kia mākina kina te uta, kia mātara tara, ke tai. Iha aki ana atakura, hi tio, hi huka, hi hauhanga. Tihe, tihe māori ora. This karakia speaks to the need to prepare for the hard times ahead. It acknowledges the greatness of life to persevere through challenges with an awe-inspiring red dawn to transform the landscape. It is a particular relevant here in Te Waipanamu and also now during Takata Rua winter. And it means get ready for the westerly, be prepared for the southerly. It will be cold inland and icy on the shore. May the dawn rise red tips on snow, on ice and on frost, the greatness of life. Tēnā koutou katoa, kei te mihi tuatahi, kei te ngai tāhu te mana whenua, te iwi whakaruru hau. Kei te mihi tuarua, kei te rangatera, Chrissy Williams. Kei te mihi tuatūru, kei te ngā kai whakaruriti. Councillor Sarah Templeton, Dr Angela Curl, Edward Wright, Ed Clayton, and Charlotte Bevington. It looks like it works, he's just waiting. Excellent. Tēnā koutou katoa. Kan nui te mihi ki a katoa katoa. Nō reira. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. My name is Grace Ryan. I welcome you to this panel discussion as chair of the Local Transportation Group Branch. Thanks all for coming this evening. I know it's hard to get to get out on this one tonight. I'll pass you over very shortly to Chrissy Williams as our facilitator tonight. Firstly, for those who may not know, the Transportation Group is a technical group within Engineering New Zealand. We have more than 1,100 members and membership is open to anyone with a professional interest in land transportation. We aim to host a variety of events for our members and tonight's event was inspired by the committee, seeing a resounding need for this discussion and learnings to be identified from the dramatic changes, challenges and opportunities revealed during our country's recent lockdown. Secondly, my deep thanks to our committee and especially Karishma, who effectively organised this event with Matty, and also to Ben as IT support and for filming this event tonight so it'll be available later on on the YouTube channel. Thanks to Crash City Council for hosting us at this venue. Um, I should note quickly that the toilets are just outside to the left, outside those doors to the left, um, and in case of any emergency, we'll follow the, um, the green exit signs outside to Worcester Street. As we go, please make a mental note of things you want explored later on. Um, we will seek to uh, follow those through with some audience questions, um, and Chrissy will tell you more. <laughs> um, thanks again to Chrissy for generously agreeing to facilitate this discussion as well. We are fortunate to benefit from her broad experience as a community leader tonight. I would like to welcome Chrissy to introduce herself and then our five wonderful panellists. Thank you. Um, and welcome to you all. And I, I think it's a privilege to be facilitating tonight. It didn't feel like it this morning. Um, so just a little bit about me. Some of you probably remember that I was a city councillor for and a community board member for about 15 years and finished in 2011. A um, couple of anecdotes from that time is um, in the early 2000s, we had to work incredibly hard as um, elected members to get the painted cycle lanes on the road. So oh, yeah. I really admire the people who've um, mm -hmm. Sarah and others who've been getting the uh, separated cycleways and I absolutely love them. So, mm -hmm. um, and the other thing we tried to do was get some bus lanes and we managed to get a few discontinuous bits of bus lane but um, inter interceded by parking outside every shop along the way. So, um, so that was, the, you know, we're up against a lot of challenges at, at, at that time. So I, I was involved with transport and urban development and um, housing and a whole lot of other things when I was a councillor. Um, after I left, just after the earthquakes in 2011, I moved on to Naitahu as a um, science advisor. And then the following uh, eight years, I've been at Environment Canterbury and then Regenerate Christchurch and then City Council of Lard. I had six months of contract here, um, Lard till October. Um, and now I'm retired from full-time work. I've been appointed as a chair of the Red Zone Transitional Use Group. That um, is a Crown Council uh, group that gives recommendations on, on land use in the Red Zone. Uh, Te Tira Kahikuhiu is our name. Um, and then my other, other NGO role is I'm on the trust of the Canterbury Alpine Trust, which is the Boyle River Outdoor Education Centre, which some of you may have been to in your, in your school days. So, so that keeps me busy. The other thing that keeps me really busy is my 
um, lovely e-mountain bike. Um, in the last two and a half years, I've done 9,000 k's. I think Sierra can beat that average, but um, yeah, it's not a competition. <laughs> <laughs> so the format from for tonight, um, there's a, a few themes that people, I think some of you have sent, sent in questions. Some of them are really detailed questions and, and some are um, sort of a bit broader. Um, so we've got some themes that the, the committee have, have um, sort of sized up for us. What, I, what I'd like to do is ask each of the panellists to spend up to about five minutes to start off with talking about who they are, um, if they represent anybody, um, what happened during the lockdown and for their specialty, and also what their lessons were. So just to introduce that, I, I've kind of got the it's a very simple way of looking at a past event or an activity, the what or what happened, the so what, and the what now, so, or the now what. So just thinking of that, um, we'll try and work through those. So I think you all know what happened. Um, 33 days of level four lockdown. Um, workplaces closed, buses were only for essential uh, workers, and car use was really, really plummeted, and a whole lot of other things which people can talk about. So. We've had to find different ways to access the services and, and to meet our needs. And I'm probably going to upset a few transport planners, but I talk about accessibility rather than transport. And I think transport is just one of the ways with that we get accessibility. Um, so we had to find ways to access um, exercise, recreation, and, and um, closeness to nature. And we did that mostly by walking, cycling locally, um, instead of going to the gym. Isn't that great? Um, and not driving further afield to places like the Port Hills or the National Park. So we all learnt to, um, to explore locally and I think you know, that's something we'll probably explore tonight. Um, we accessed work and meetings and social connections through Zoom and Skype and other um, online apps. Um, some of us had coffee meetings on Zoom without any meetings going on. And interestingly, my, my siblings, two of whom live in the States and three in New Zealand, we've been continued to have um, two week Zoom meetings, so, um, which is pretty good for so, some all post 65 year olds. Um, and then we accessed food and other services by either shopping alone at the supermarket, so the supermarket became a very functional um, process by having someone deliver our shopping or by shopping online. So we found ways to access what we needed without having to necessarily travel um, to it. So that's just, a, I guess, a, a brief in, a, intro. So I'm going to start with Angela, just because she's furthest away. Um, if you can just introduce yourself, Angela, talk about the lockdown for your, your interest area and also the lessons you learned. Do I go to uh, so I'm Angela Pell. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Population Health at the University of Otago in Christchurch. Um, some people don't know we exist, so for those of you who don't, we're just, I'm just a few minutes away on Foster Street, but I'm in the hospital. Um, so I had to travel a long time ago to get here today. Um, so my research background is broadly in transport and health. Um, I started like as a transport planner and saw the light. Um, <laughs> okay, so I never thought I'd move on to uh, So I started as a transport planner, then I went back and did a PhD in transport geography. Um, and then I started looking at public around health and transport more, more specifically. And my interest is particularly are in the social inclusiveness of transport and, and the health implications of that. So the health and social impacts of how we get around. Um, and at the moment, I'm working on projects around um, e-scooters, the new transport technologies, e-scooters and autonomous vehicles, and what that might mean for health and wellbeing. Um, and also around age-friendly cities, and um, some work on how we design for different groups of people, um, and doing a bit of work on pedestrian pools. Um, so I'm a geographer by background, so I'm interested in place and the impacts of places on how we get around, and I think during the lockdown we all became a lot more aware. Can you hear me? No. No. <laughs> Sorry. I think during lockdown we all became much more aware of our place and where we live and the heightened importance of location. So that's um, something that um, was really important. Um, so in terms of what it taught me for my area, um, in public health, um, taught us a lot. Um, so it's hard to know where to, where to start with thinking about public health. But I think what lockdown has taught us is that we can prioritise the needs of the population as a whole. We can think about everybody as opposed to individual needs. So we all did what we needed to do for the for population health, public health, um, rather than our individual interests. 
context, which is really important when we're thinking about the kinds of change that we need to make to tackle the global challenges like climate change. Uh, I think we also learned that we can dramatically reduce travel. We can reduce the amount of travel happens, so we can do that. But obviously, we can do it in a certain context. Impacts of reducing travel, and we saw some of the positive impacts of living more locally, spending more time in a local area, much quieter streets, and reduced, improved air quality in those areas, so reduced pollution. So we can see all of those public health benefits of that reduced travel, and we can hopefully use that to kind of get people more engaged with the idea of reducing, reducing travel. And so, in terms of transport and health, I think there's three main ways that transport relates to health outcomes. And so as transport is often just a facilitator and it relates to health firstly because it allows us to access things that are important to health so it allows us to access green space employment health care and all of these things that are important to health and well-being so it facilitates access to positive um, places um, and it and also there's benefits for the in terms of the physical and mental health impacts of actual the actual movement so physical activity and um, mental health outcomes of actually being able to move and transport is also important for health because it gives us that ability to move and the fact, the fact that we know we can get around even if we don't actually do it is actually really important for psychological well-being. And all three of those things changed quite a lot um, during the lockdown. So the things that we could access and um, the ways in which we moved and the impacts on that physical and mental health and also the ability to move and the ways in which we can move to move distances has changed a lot. So it's taught us quite a lot in the areas. Um, from my perspective. Um, and then I think there's also equity implications of thinking about who could or could not move um, and the implications of that um, I'm going to hand over to Ed Clayton now. So Ed, if you're just checking check the technology, if it doesn't move, then we'll move on to zero. So why don't you go, Ed? Yeah, um, even if you can hear me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no feedback. No. Okay, good. Um, yeah, first of all, a uh, big thank you to the Christchurch um, branch of the Transportation Group for having me along tonight. And it's really real pleasure to be invited to talk about these sorts of things. And uh, quite, quite a uh, good thing that we can sit here and review this. About myself, um, I, I'm actually an environmental scientist, um, a hydrologist, and sort of freshwater quality specialist, not an engineer. Um, and I'm representing the Sustainability Society tonight, which is another technical interest group of Engineering New Zealand. Um, I think my sort of route to sustainability has come through the work that I've done. Um, interestingly enough, similar to Angela, I was a transport planner for my first job out, out of university. Um, but I was building roads and widening intersections, and it didn't really sit with my idea of, of how we should move around the city. And I ended up quitting that job and then working in environmental monitoring. And the more you work in environmental monitoring, the more you observe the environment around you. You observe the interactions that happen between the freshwater and the infrastructure that surrounds it. And observing the urban pollution that comes from our built infrastructure, and especially roading, that's uh, really encouraged me to pursue interests around different types of mobility and accessibility and I totally agree with you there Chrissy like uh, transport is, is a small term that should be wider and um, more encompassing if we if we think about accessibility and mobility there's a really good terms to use. Um, I, I, I think the lessons that I have from lockdown um, I had a group of friends that were quite close to me and so in level three we could go biking around the streets together and uh, that was that was really an interesting perspective in the way that you view the city that you don't normally seem to get so that ability to move around easily you observe more of that streetscape uh, than you otherwise see from your car and it's that sort of small interaction and exploration that occurs when you're in an active mode of transport compared to sitting inside a vehicle that really makes you appreciate the city that you uh, that you're in and then it comes down to the accessibility to that 
blue and green infrastructure that supports their mental health and well-being as well. And I'm really interested in Angela's comments there around that health aspect to the to transport and mobility that we get as well. Um, I, I sort of think that there's there's a few things we could have done better coming out of that lockdown space. In, in Auckland, we had quite a lot of temporary cycle lanes that went in, like coned off sections of arterial roads to allow people to bike around at level three, including Queen Street, Ponsonby Road, Tamaki Drive. And yet when we came to level two, the demand from people who wanted to drive was that we remove them all. Um, Queen Street, we we're lucky enough that they already had programs in place planning around how they would uh, address the, the traffic choke points along there anyway. That's, that was already underway. But we've lost all of our temporary cycle spaces that we had. And it's, it's probably resulted in less people wanting to get out and bike. Uh, conversations that you have with people uh, everyone talks about how easy it was to move around during those periods. And you know, there's a desire for people to get out and have that easy mobility, but it's in sometimes a direct conflict to what we are uh, expected to, how we're expected to behave in the way that we move around our city for commuting, for, for work, for recreation, getting to sports, all these sorts of things. So. Um, I think that's enough for me for now, but I'm really interested to hear from the other panelists and, and how we go about sort of realising these opportunities we have. Thank you, Rajiv. Yes, Sarah. Tēnā koutou nui kia koutou. Um, so, yeah, I'm a second term City Councillor here at Christchurch City Council and currently wearing my council, elected councillor hat. So my own views, um, not the views of council. Um, and I have made a significant uh, transition myself over the last five years. So my first elected role was uh, on the community board at the Ferry Maid. And so five years ago we were sitting around the table making um, some recommendations to the ITI committee on a uh, cycle route for the Rapanui Shadrock cycleway. And I looked around the table, I was chairing the meeting, looked around the table and had this epiphany that, you know, there, were, there was, um, seven of us sitting around the table, none of us had biked any of the routes that were being proposed. And we were being asked for our recommendations, um, and I'd ask people, you know, have you biked the route, have you walked it, those kind of things, no, but I know the streets really well, therefore I'm qualified. Um, and so, at that stage I didn't own a bike. Um, so I did a whole pile of research, and being unfit and overweight, and you know, mum of three kids juggling bits and pieces, I uh, opted for an e-bike and haven't looked back. Um, bit of a transition uh, to start with biking a wee bit um, and driving less. And then once I was elected, you know, that, that shift that you make sometimes when you change jobs, change your workplace, you're going from part-time to full-time. And um, I made the big switch into cycling um, almost every day, um, passing otherwise. And then at the beginning of last year, I sold my car. and. Um, my husband's still owns one, but it's um, we've got three kids and stuff. But it's uh, it, you know, it's just been easy. There's been the odd time that I've um, we've made two vehicles, but there's you know the electric car share scheme which we joined, and um, we've hired those a couple of times, um, and that's been better. So it's been one of those big transformations, and I'm like, well, I can do it as a you know middle-aged um, mum of three and unfit and stuff. And actually, a lot of people can, and um, that's actually been a useful story to be able to share with people, um, which has been good. So that was kind of my kind of bio there. So I currently chair the Council's Sustainability and Community Resilience Committee, um, not the Transport Committee, but I have a huge interest in the transport space, um, and I'm on the committee, it's a committee of the Council, um, and have ended up doing a whole part of things around the transport space because of my interest in climate change and behaviour change around that, and so it's been a an area that I'm really interested in. 53% of the city's emissions come from transport, 42% I think of which are the road transport system, um, and then the rest are from the, the air and port and things. So, so it's there. So um, <clears throat> I guess that's kind of my bio. Lessons from lockdown. Um, I was lucky enough, I am lucky enough, I live in Valley, so I actually have very close access to the Port Hills. 
um, and was up road path most days, which was just lovely, actually hardly hopped on my bike, um, which was interesting. He did a lot more walking locally, which I didn't get to do, whereas I usually get to hop on my bike, uh, which was good. <clears throat> One of the things we've struggled with as a council is uh, evidence, because no matter how much actual written evidence and research and statistics and things you show people from other cities or even outside of town, they, people still don't believe that people change behaviours and that people will bike or walk or change modes and they will change their behaviours based on the infrastructure that you provide. And, uh, or that people even own bikes, I guess. <laughs> so the evidence of our own eyes during lockdown, and everyone shared that experience, was that people got out in, in, on their feet and on wheels, the small wheels, big wheels, um, and they did it in families, old people, young people, families with lots of young kids on the road. And as someone said to me, you know, actually we're not lacking cycling infrastructure, we just put cars on it all the time. <laughs> so actually we've got a whole pile of amazing roads, right? That are actually not particularly well sealed, but um, <laughs> hogs working on that one. Um, but actually, it, it's it's the the vehicle traffic that puts people off, and that was really really clear. And people got out their bikes, they dusted them off, they biked during lockdown, and then they put them away once the once the cars came back on the road. And I know a few people um, who just told me these stories about that happening. And um, so how we can capture that? I don't think we took as many opportunities as, as we could at the end of that to really try and reinforce those behaviours. There was a, a tension in a couple of areas between the, you know, the working at home and the, the commute as well, where there was this, hey, actually, it's really good for our environment. We can see, you can see from the top of the bridle path, clear, crystal clear across the city, all the way to the Alps, which you cannot do normally. Um, and there was this tension between uh, the environmental improvements that we could see in our well-being and getting back to business um, and supporting the central city and coming in and getting people back into work in town so they could support other businesses. So I think we've got a, a, a bit of work to do and things we can learn for next time as well. So. Um, hi, I'm Charlotte um, and if you don't, I think everybody in this store is almost a customer of our, of our shop, Action Bicycle Club. Uh, so if you don't know me already, I'm one of the founders uh, of Action Bicycle Club. Uh, we are a transport focused bike shop in the central city and probably one of the, well, maybe three in New Zealand that really consider themselves a transport focused uh, bike shop. Um, I got into the humble bicycle when I lived in Shanghai. Um, if you've ever been to China, you will know that there's bikes everywhere. Um, people just get around on bikes. Uh, they have very simple infrastructure, uh, but with uh, cars costing so much and public transport being such a crammed um, space, People use their bikes to get around and they put everything on their bikes. They go shopping, they carry beds on their bikes, they move house, they carry like furniture to sell on the side of the road. Like everything is done by a bike. Um, and yeah, if you if you live in a city like that, you get a bike and that becomes your life. Um, and every time I came back to New Zealand, there nobody was on a bike and I just I couldn't really understand it. Like, Bikes were a way for people to connect with each other. Um, bikes were a way for people to meet, um, to get around. And in New Zealand, no one rode their bikes. Like everybody drove their cars. You wouldn't see a bike or ever. Like the streets were just built for cars. And I couldn't, I couldn't really understand. Like bikes for me were such a life changer. And why? weren't people thinking in the same way as, as me. So um, Ken and I, my partner, uh, decided that, you know, like we have to do something. This is such a opportunity that we can tap into. Um, so that's why uh, we decided from Shanghai to move back to New Zealand. 
um, there was post-earthquake uh, when Christchurch was talking a lot about cycle waves. Um, so we thought, oh yeah, Christchurch is quite an easy target. They're already talking about it. Uh, we can provide the goods. Um, so yeah, why don't, why don't we give it a try? And um, I think it's been almost four years now for this <laughs> shop in St. Martin. And yeah, every year it's growing and growing. People are becoming more interested in bikes as uh, transport, um, especially you know the the simple upright step through bicycle. We put a bag, you can bike to work, you've got your basket, and yeah, most recently electric bikes as well. Um, they're really taking off. Um, lockdown obviously told us that <laughs> bikes people want to ride their bikes. Um, it's yeah for I think for everybody it was like a spiritual awakening. Um, this thing that had been suppressed inside us for so long just came to fruition and um, people dusted off their bikes, they rode around their neighbourhoods, they uh, spent time with their families, um, children learned how to ride their bikes, uh, you know, they explored their neighbourhoods, um, saw their neighbours down the street, met new neighbours that they didn't know, um, all because of the, the bicycle. Um, so, yeah, I think that, yeah, that's just such an amazing thing that came out of the lockdown. Um, but on the, on the flip side, it showed us, lockdown showed us that, uh, that people will not bike with, in this, with unsafe streets. Uh, streets are full of cars, um, people will not bike. So, um, that was a really important lesson for us as well. It showed us that people wanted to bike, but they will not if our streets are built for cars. And yeah, uh, it was quite interesting for for me as a bike shop owner. Uh, basically, we had to shut our shop. Um, we consider ourselves a transport focused business, and we did believe that we could provide an essential service to uh, people that were using their bikes as a mode of transport. Um, and if you if reading the wording on the government website, we could actually have done that. Um, but uh, because society is so uh, brainwashed by bikes being leisure uh, uh, objects, uh, we were actually told by another bike store that we have some relationship with that we should not open our shop because uh, bikes are leisure activities and the government has told us that only essential businesses should open. So yeah, we had to shut down. <laughs> we, we had uh, four weeks of uh, spending time at home. Um, I didn't really ride my bike at all, uh, but I did a lot of walking, which was nice. And yeah, um, I just, I'm so passionate about just people riding bikes every day. Um, I think that more people riding bikes can just create such wonderful cities. Um, and yeah, all we need is just more people doing it. Good evening, everyone. So I'm Edward Wright, Manager of Public Transport Strategy Planning and Marketing at Environment Canterbury. But tonight I'm going to give you some personal reflections on the lockdown. And so any comments, particularly the future focused ones, are not necessarily representative of, of the views of Environment Canterbury as a whole. Just get that disclaimer out there first. Um, so like Angela, I'm a geographer by training um, at the University of Canterbury. Um, one of Simon Kingham's master's graduates, there's a surprising number uh, around Christchurch, around New Zealand, and I'm not the only one in the room tonight, I know. Um, so I did my master's thesis on public transport uh, use in Christchurch and I was lucky enough to get a job at Environment Canterbury and that was about a decade ago now, just in time for the September earthquake, which of course at the time we thought was a big deal, and then the, uh, the February earthquake. And the reason I mentioned the earthquakes is because it, it was something quite unique to Canterbury in terms of having dealt with a major disruptor before and some of our colleagues around the country haven't uh, had that quite the same experience before. 
before I come to that in more detail. So yes, I've been at Environment Canterbury on and off since I was a student. Um, I had three years away in London, and a lot of people think I'm, I'm completely blind and only public transport person. But in London, I worked on cycling strategy stuff and transport for London. So I have I've been on the cycling side of the fence as well. Um, so yeah, I've been back in Christchurch for about three years now. And um, I'm lucky enough to, to lead a team and who, who do the, the planning, uh, the scheduling, the marketing of um, bus services here in Christchurch. So lockdown was an interesting experience for us. It was actually busier than normal, and, and we were already pretty busy to start with, but it didn't quieten down at all. And I think the, the most abiding memory of it was that it was quite frantic and quite manic for us. And whenever we thought we had something sorted, it would change. So prior to lockdown, the weekend prior to lockdown, when the alert level system was announced, um, we spent all Sunday in the office figuring out how we were going to respond to it. And we had all our plans in place. We communicated out certain things about physical distancing with that. We, we had a, a plan that we were going to withdraw cash off buses. Uh, later in the week, of which ultimately turned out to be the lockdown week. And then on Monday, came to work at 1.30 on Monday, um, the announcement happened. <laughs> so all of that work got thrown out, a lot of posters got pulled, that were already printed ready to go, and we started work on what does Alert Level 4 look like. And it was an ongoing, constant period. Of course, we went to the office for, for very much longer after that. We were all working from home. We moved the, the Metro Info Call Centre uh, into people's houses so that we could keep that service going. Uh, and the rest of our team were all based at home. We're very lucky that Environment Canterbury had such good technology that it was almost seamless. And although it was quite weird to watch all the um, computer screens and hard drives exit in the building on that sort of Monday, Tuesday before lockdown, <laughs> they were just, uh, and they took the, the chairs and all sorts of stuff that you're not meant to take out of the office, it just all wandered out of the building ready to go. But we, we we're able from a technology perspective to keep working throughout. We had bus services that kept going throughout. There was quite clear direction from central government about who was able to travel uh, and what kind of services we should be providing. So through Alert Level 4, we had a Sunday service in place. Uh, then Alert Level 3 had, uh, changed a little bit. And then Alert Level 2, we increased the level of service each stage we were preparing for sort of multiple different ways things could go. I think it was a surprise to all of us how Alert Level 2 was a lot shorter uh, than uh, we expected. We're quite thankful for that because once schools went back, the capacity challenge of only having about 40% of the normal set of capacity on buses uh, became quite a severe challenge uh, around the country, not just here. Uh, it, it felt very wrong to be sending out emails uh, to a, a database that go against everything I spent the last decade working for, essentially telling people not to use the bus unless they absolutely had to, not to put your kids on the bus to school if you had another option because the buses wouldn't have enough capacity. It, it, it just didn't feel right to be doing that. And I didn't take the bus myself while I was at home the whole time, of course, working, but I at one point, I could have taken the bus, and I thought, well, actually, I've just spent the last few weeks putting out communications saying you shouldn't use the bus unless you're an essential worker, uh, or you have an essential reason to travel, so I probably can't actually justify jumping on the bus myself right now. And that felt weird, too. I had about, what was it, seven or eight weeks of not using public transport myself, because that's the same as what I was telling everyone else to do. Um, and, of course, my travel leads during that period were generally local. So it was a very odd period. Um, uh, it's not over necessarily. Um, we just sort of called this afternoon uh, with uh, colleagues from right around the country. Uh, and uh, we were talking a little bit about preparing in case, we all hope, that we, don't, that we go up alert levels again. So there needs to be plans in place for what happens in the event we all hope not to happen. And uh, there's more community transmission in New Zealand. Um, so yeah, finger, fingers very much crossed we don't go that way, but it has been quite a interesting period. 
And coming back to that first thought about the difference to the earthquake, I think at the start of the period, uh, I have a number of colleagues who, who were there through the earthquake periods as well. So I think at the start of the period, we had a bit of a head start in terms of responding to something that was a massive disruption. We, we had been there, we had to do that before in a different way. Uh, other regions, you notice, sort of catch up in their approach a little bit during the, during the period. And the great thing that has come out of it in the public transport sector is we're talking to other regional councils a heck of a lot more than we were prior to this. We're sharing a lot more information and ideas. And I really hope that that is something that we continue. Um, I'm very involved in trying to foster that collaboration um, the work stream lead for the regional council sector and public transport. And I'm trying to make sure these, these meetings keep going and that we keep encouraging uh, and our, our fellow uh, colleagues right around the country to keep talking, keep sharing ideas, not trying to reinvent the wheel in every region uh, when we, we can be working together a lot more. So I think that's one really positive thing that I hope comes out of this situation we all hope we never had to, to deal with. Uh, so patronage in Christchurch is roughly 80% uh, compared to the same time last year. And uh, so it's built back fairly well. It's interesting to compare notes around the country. Different regions are having different experiences. Uh, I can't speak for other regions entirely, so don't quote me on any of these figures, but I think Auckland is more than 70% of Houston patronage region, and Wellington's more than 90% of normal patronage. So we're seeing slightly different levels of response in the, in the different regions. Uh, there's, in the smaller regions, some different things going on. In some regions, particularly Otago, uh, still have free fares at the moment, so they're seeing different levels of, of response uh, to that. Um, one, other, oh, one other little thing that you just reminded me with patronage. In Timaru, we were doing an on-demand transport trial, and we were lucky that the, the pilot had just launched in February, and we sent out an email to everyone telling them that oh, COVID's happening, we're going to turn off the trial. And the next day we realised that actually best response for public transport in Timaru was just use on-demand. So it became, it, it got launched uh, publicly a lot earlier than it was planned to be. And we used it as the response in Timaru. Uh, so our Timaru patronage is, is going really well. It's about 100% about of normal um, at the moment with on-demand and some fixed route services having been reintroduced in Timaru as well. So that's that's another slight difference in, in patronage. Thanks, thanks Edward. Um, it's really hard to know where to go from here. Um, Edward's example of telling people not to get the bus, it feels like the yellow bin syndrome a little bit, doesn't it? Tell people to put rubbish in the yellow bin and they don't know how to stop. Um, so people are still not using the bus because they, perhaps they've got that, that same message of not, not, to, not to use it. Um, rather than getting into the nitty gritty about buses or bikes, I, the question I, I'd perhaps like to pose to the, the panel is, um, around flexible working arrangements and the lessons the lessons from that. So, so I'm trying to think of some of the ongoing changes or benefits, maybe just benefits in some cases, um, fr from what we what we did during the lockdown. So if you just would like to talk about um, flexible working arrangements and how that might affect transport systems, our access to, to services and those kinds of things. So um, I'm just going to pick on people in the order and the, um, does it sound, make sense? So Charlotte, I'm going to start with you, just. Um, yeah, this is quite a hard one for for me. Um, actually, when I think about it, I, I don't really know if it's a good thing because, uh, you know, people need to get out on their bikes for exercise. Um, and if we want people to move around on their bikes, uh, telling people or making people stay home is kind of, it's like the opposite of that. Um, so yeah, we need people to move around for transport, um, to get to work on their bikes, um, things. So mm, not really sure if, if I agree with um, working from home things. That's why I call it flexible working. Flexible working. Or 
Um, I think one of the things is that, that we had that um, the tension when we came back um, to level two, level one, between that whole getting back to business and coming into town um, and people's desire to be more environmentally friendly and work from home more. And so I, I was on the bus on the way in this morning talking to a council staff member who's husband is now working from home, his office is actually shut up, um, and they now, um, on demand, have a, an office space that they can get for a couple of hours at a time for meetings if they need to. They get together um, once a fortnight in person at a cafe or something like that. But apart from that, they all work from home now, and they um, they do web design and those kind of things. So it's relatively straightforward to do, and they, they meet online, but they've actually made that change as a business already. It's the first time I've actually talked to someone who's kind of in that position, um, which is really good. And it occurs to me that the whole back to business and back to the CBD thing, uh, if you're not doing that, actually, if you're at home or you're doing flexible, you're supporting your local businesses because you're still going to go for coffees and things. And I know that I've met people either in Ferrymead or the little cafe in Heathcote, those kind of places, when I've been doing a bit of working from home rather than actually meeting people in a business in town. So you're still supporting businesses in some way, they're just maybe not necessarily the CBD ones. Um, the effects of transport planning. Obviously. Yeah, if you're able to lower than, so we're looking at Christchurch over the next 30 years is gonna go from, we've got a Christchurch from what, 365 to 475, or something like that thousand. There are a lot of extra people, potentially a lot of, um, if we were just doing BAU, an extra Excel, 90,000 single occupancy cars or something like that. Um, but if you're able to push out that demand, lower that, um, over time you save a whole pile of carbon and money and a, and a range of things and you can increase wellbeing um, and a range of things there too. So there's a lot more people now doing one or two days a week at home or, or something like that, which is, which is super cool. Um, flexible working hours as well coming in so you're easing that the, the pressure on um, the actual uh, sort of rush out traffic and those kind of things I think will will make a difference too and this you know there used to be excuses you know businesses are like oh no we, we can't possibly you work from home because pretty much internally because we don't trust you to actually do the work um, but actually there's some evidence now that shows that people work harder because actually there's no boundaries and so they end up working sort of longer hours and stuff so I'm not quite sure that's good well-being as a parent, I was incredibly, incredibly grateful that, 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 that this didn't happen when my kids were small. Because working at, from home when your kids are little is not much fun. Um, I've got teenagers now, it was pretty cruisy, way too much tablet time. Um, but yeah, much easier, so yeah. Um, so I think there's definitely been some benefits in terms of more flexible working and people having to think about working differently. Um, I know there's been huge increases in telemedicine. Um, so tra uh, traveling to healthcare is often really a barrier to some people accessing care, and especially in rural areas, it's really difficult. And healthcare professionals have been forced to offer in a different way, and that's actually improved access. So reducing them to travel to access essential services and has some positive impacts like that. Um, but in terms of commuting, things we're working, I think we need to to be really careful about thinking about existing trips and what new trips might occur as a result of being able to work further away from home, work remotely, and not have to go to the office. So, um, obviously, we've seen the impacts of traffic of working from home on traffic at the moment, uh, but I think most of the evidence in this suggests that what you see is a rebound effect. So, if people are traveling only two days a week instead of five, then they can actually look further away. So, they're not actually traveling any less, they're just mm -hmm traveling further, and so we might see more sport. Um, and they also travel more for other reasons. So that doesn't mean there's not benefits in terms of reducing pressure on the network at commuting periods, but there's not necessarily any environmental or health benefits in terms of reducing travel overall. So we need to think about how we can take those benefits, but also not just encourage people to live further and further away. And I know anecdotally, a couple of people in the UK, there's offices that have already said we're not reopening, they've not renewed leases on offices, and then they're saying, well, I don't need to live in London because that will just move further away, but they also have to travel you know, so often. And so, do we actually see this happen? So, it's quite a challenge to achieve that. Um, yeah, I think it's just about the benefits of it's quite interesting because I think our, our transport network is built around catering for 
our peak hour demands. And and when we start thinking about the opportunity to have flexible hours and spreading that load, um, it, it, it really changes the way that we could utilise our road space and it makes it potentially much more effective. But it has to be supported with adequate infrastructure and that comes with that, that actual public transport infrastructure. So the amount of buses, when they travel, where they travel to. Because again, peak services for public transport tend to be obviously a lot more frequent and a lot more reliable than what you would get off peak. So if we looked at those sorts of impacts, I mean, Auckland Transport introduced, I think for um, the month of June, they had discounted fares in that sort of shoulder period off peak. So you could deliberately delay your timing and get to work for a cheaper fare. Um, I don't know that working from home necessarily is is a great thing. Um, I don't have children and I noticed a, a, a strong blending of time whereby going from a, a work situation to a home situation, uh, it, it's quite hard to differentiate them without that commute. And my commute tends to be quite active It's either walking or cycling or occasionally catching a bus. And so like Charlotte was saying, that you then start losing that physical activity as part of it. And walking's an incredibly good uh, sort of mental health conditioner that you can do every day that helps you focus when you arrive at work. So there's positives and negatives to it, and I think it's quite a complex issue. Um, in saying that, I, I've, I've enjoyed working from home and been having that opportunity to do it. Uh, it what, one person I was talking to actually raised a good point as well as that if you have a big organisation, is how much do they facilitate it? It might be cheaper for them to decrease people's sort of hours at work by 10 to 20% per week, which is just one day. But if that means they're not supporting you with the computer equipment to work from home, I mean, you have health and safety workstation assessments that you go through at work to make sure you have everything set up correctly. And if you're going to be working off a small laptop on your couch, is that going to have impacts later on that we see working at a cafe might not be the best thing for your the body position you have, all these sorts of things. So it, it's, it's pretty complex, but um, overall, I've enjoyed it. So it's good. <laughs> I completely agree with some of the points you just made in terms of, <clears throat> I me, mean, in terms of the, the disbenefits of uh, working from home. Uh, I was completely over it after about seven or eight weeks. It was fun to start with. Uh, I noticed when daylight saving changed, and I couldn't go for a walk. It was too, too bloody cold to go for a walk at um, five o'clock at night in the dark. That I was hardly getting any exercise. So part of my daily commute is walking to the bus, and suddenly I felt bad that I wasn't doing that anymore. And then I get to walk to this building quite a bit um, every week too from, from our building. All those bits of exercise that sort of get um, incrementally put into your day. So on a personal level, uh, I was quite excited to be back in the office and it was lovely and warm as well. <laughs> it was getting really cold. Um, but if I think a bit more broadly in terms of uh, public transport, uh, if if it does mean that long term our public transport numbers don't just go back to where they were, i.e. there's a portion of people who are working from home and therefore travelling on public transport less, that does present an opportunity because it means we have more capacity uh, to try and attract more people onto public transport without having to spend more money. So we can try and get more people out of the car without having to, to invest quite as much as we might have anticipated previously. And, and if you think about Auckland's uh, and, and Wellington, who have even greater peaks in terms of their public transport vehicles on the road, they have very, very peaky, and Wellington even more so than Auckland. A huge uh, peak bus, numbers of peak buses that may only be one or two trips every peak. If, if you don't need to continually increase that um, as much as you might have otherwise, that's a good thing. If you can spread the demand more, uh, like Ed mentioned, there was a, a deal in Auckland to try and spread the demand through June, which was actually really to, I, as I understand it, to try and spread the demand during level two when they're having the massive capacity challenges. But if you put in place things that respond to those flexible um, working arrangements, it, I think it actually presents an opportunity in the, in the public transport sector. 
really interesting. Um, just a wee anecdote, my, my sister-in-law who, uh, who lives in, the, in New York, um, she was working from home, but each morning she would walk to the tube station and back to separate herself from, from work and home, but she went back to home to work, but that was her way of um, putting, putting the barrier between home and work. Um, I don't know. What, I don't think she did it at the end of the day, so she must have just stayed at you know, work all night. So. Um, I'm going to I could choose some of these other sort of discussion points, but um, we'd it'd be really good to have involvement from people over here. So, has anyone got a question that they would like to ask this group, either individuals or the whole panel? Yeah. Um, how are we how are we going to record this? Do you, I'll show it here, but yeah, you can use that mic. That's very important. Hello, uh, thanks for uh, Translation Group for organising this event. It's um, really insightful. Um, I just had a couple of questions actually. First one was around so some of the comments that were raised were, you know, how positive the lockdown was in terms of, you know, you, you were leaving your house, you were seeing families, kids out in the street, people walking, cycling. And then lockdown finished, and then it was kind of like we just went back to square one. So the first question is around kind of how do we how do we enable that, that long-term mode shift and that behavior change? And then the second question that kind of leads on to that is around, and it's kind of been touched on, um, and it's the issue around what I feel is this um, tra travel demand and, and transport is, is, is coupled alongside um, economic activity and city vibrance and, and you know how successful we want Christchurch to be. So, you know, whilst the council's been saying for years, you know, we need a central city again after the earthquakes and and then we had everyone leaving again, locked down and everyone was going up to the cafes like you said. But then but we need people to be back in the central city. We need a we need a vibrant city centre. So, but at the same time how do we square that against some of the sustainability and environmental objectives as well. So be interested to hear Thank you. So we'll start with the first one, um, and you don't all need to answer it, but anyone want to contribute about what's how do we have long, try and get long term modal shift or behaviour change? Um, I guess thinking of the lockdown as, as the um, pressure point. Um, the thing that was the standout in the lockdown for me is is the language that the government used. Um, they clearly said, do not drive a car. Um, and you may use your bike or go for a walk for exercise. And Kiwis love following the rules. <laughs> so we, yeah, we didn't drive our cars. We drove to the supermarket because the government said you can drive to the supermarket, but we didn't drive anywhere else um, and we used our our bikes and we walked for exercise. Um, so I think it it's not up to, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's an amount of uh, effort that we as citizens can put into making this change, but if we really want um, dramatic change and things to happen, it's really about, you know, like that force coming from the top and people using the right language to say, you know, don't, don't drive your car, uh, take the bus to work or take your bike to work. And I think until we have that kind of uh, language, we'll still be just doing the same thing, uh, business as usual. Quite right. <laughs> um, so it's yeah, one of those things that, um, I do my thing, I mean, I like the transport stuff, but it's in the climate context, in the environment stuff mainly for me, and the wellbeing space. And so the, the things that we learned from the COVID um, lockdown and a, and a crisis there, were that the unity of purpose is a driver, not just what we're being told by, you know, the, the current sort of capitalist kind of stuff. That, you know, money drives behaviour, right? Has it has been the the mantra for a long time, but actually there's a whole part of research now that shows that unity of purpose and sense of um, ownership of and common goal actually drives a whole part of behaviour change. And we don't do that very well in um, our city space and transport spaces. It's very easy, she says, to spend money on hard infrastructure. Okay, it's really easy to put a line in your LTP that says cycle lane or 
or a bit of road or whatever it is, it's really, really hard to put OPEX on budget that says travel demand management, soft stuff. It's really hard to get the buy-in, oh man, have the bloody business case done? Seriously? Um, for funding to do travel demand management. And yet all that is is really good comms and we're not doing it very well. I just noticed um, that someone put up a, a post on the Women in Urbanism Facebook page with a really cool ad on the back of a bus in Auckland. Um, I don't know if anyone's seen that, but it's about, you know, it's about that, it's on the back of the bus and it's someone enjoying their bus ride. So you're sitting in the car behind it and you're looking at this bus with someone enjoying their bus ride on it. Um, and it's saying, you know, could this be part of your future transport um, kind of thing? And we don't do that generally very well. But we, we know that collective action makes a difference. We learned that from COVID, right? Um, and that no matter all the rules the government put in place, you know, if we'd chosen not to follow those, they couldn't, have, they couldn't have arrested all of us, right? We chose to follow those rules because we had a sense of purpose. Um, collective action made a difference. And we saw the environment respond really, really clearly. And there were pictures up, I mean, apart from the poor hills to the Alps, there were pictures up of, you know, was it dolphins in Venice and, you know, all of that kind of stuff and villages overrun with goats. Um, but the, the environment responds when we all act, and those kind of things are really powerful. Yeah, do you want to come to that point? Um, yeah, yeah, that's a great point, actually. Yeah, there's, there's, there's been some very clear observations around how uh, water quality and air quality has responded to changes from, from lockdown. And it's not just Auckland in New Zealand, it's across, I mean, uh, the world. China had massive changes in air quality indexes that they, they observed during that lockdown period. Um, there's been numerous cases overseas where, where these water quality parameters have been observed to change. And it's not just in scientific me means, it's, it's just visual observation of, of what has improved. Um, but if we come back to sort of talking about uh, have we done enough to enable mode shift? Um, I think the simple answer is no, we haven't, because um, we we have a long lag time between designing these ideas and changing our transport modes, and and we could do it a lot faster if we if we adapted some of that more tactical urbanism sort of ideas around doing maybe a, a car free Sunday or uh, you know putting in a closed street and having a having a neighbourhood kids zone or something like that so it's only temporary but it can be quite effective in encouraging people's behavior change and um, I think we we had a, the luxury of having a month-long behavior change experiment which we all really enjoyed and yet we haven't felt any safer or more enabled to go out and do these things afterwards and it's a lost opportunity and um, unless we have a quick response where we can easily engage and easily go out and achieve these sorts of things with temporary in some cases temporary solutions, we, we won't ever get back to that feeling, so. Is it too late yet? I don't think it's too late. Um, I, I think we can get there if we want to, but it's about engaging people and trying to encourage people. And the, the overwhelming feeling after that lockdown is it's not safe to continue to have those habits. It's it's noisy, it's, you know, smelly to ride along those roads. And so they we might have lost that that initial momentum we had, but we can regain it if we if we make an effort. Yeah. Um, I think one of the things I've noticed that might be helpful in terms of changing the way we travel is not about mode shift, but that the language is starting to change more. We're talking about mode shift, people realise that we can actually reduce the amount of travel overall. So talking about shifting modes still further assumes we can do everything we want to do, and we're just going to do it in a different way. And I think if we really want to achieve environmental and health goal that it actually needs to be reduction in travel, which means we need to change the place, the kinds of things we're doing and the amount of which we're doing, which relates to your second point about how can we have vibrant city centres and achieve um, some of the benefits of mode shift, which is to make sure that we're travelling shorter distances and to make denser uh, centres that are more vibrant and don't require travelling by carbon intensive routes. So the, the second question was around um, travel demand and a vibrant CBD. Um, just a, a comment on that, that last one was um, people, I think you mentioned, Charlotte, that people stopped walking 
um, as soon as we got into level three. And cars increased as soon as we got into level three. As well as, I think time was an issue. So in, le in, the, in level four, people had a lot of time. I mean, I stopped walking and I've got, I'm retired, I've got all the time in the world, <laughs> but I've stopped walking and back on my bike a lot more. So, you know, I think it's interesting, what, just that you're looking at their own personal behavior and I need to look at them, why, why did I do that? And, and probably because I'm a few biking. Um, but travel demand and a vibrant CBD, and I, an issue that comes up for me here is, is a vibrant CBD doesn't have 25% of its land covered with car parks, but um, I will let others answer this. I might start this one off. Um, from a public transport perspective, we're all for a vibrant CBD that doesn't have any gravel car parks. Um, again, this is my personal view. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, we have a, a, a wonderful piece of public transport infrastructure in the heart of the CBD, in my view, probably the best piece of public transport infrastructure in New Zealand with our bus interchange. Uh, we have a network that no matter how we structure the bus network in Christchurch, it's always going to be very centred on the CBD, given the nature of our city and how it mushrooms out from the CBD. So increasing the, the vibrancy of the CBD is something I'm very interested in. I think public transport and cycling and active modes can all play a key part in that. Um, uh, one potential thing is if uh, the amount of office space that's needed reduces slightly in the future, it might mean that some of these empty spaces stay for a little bit longer. So perhaps we need to look at other kinds of uh, stuff we can get into the city instead. Um, yeah, I'd better be careful how much I say about trying to not grow quite as much in the suburbs as, as we have in Christchurch. Um, but personally, I'd, I'd very much like to see less development happening like the kind that's happened on Langdon's Road recently with um, that kind of sprawling development on the old Firestone site. Uh, that's very hard to serve with, with public transport. Uh, development in, in central city, both retail, office, whatnot, is it's very much easier to support with public transport. So. I'm all for this suburban sprawl and, and uh, a wonderful CBD like we all hope to have here in Christchurch. Um, I think what's important to consider when talking about vibrant cities is how you move people in and out of the cities. Um, with buses, you can move like a mass of people uh, all at once. So when you see that mass of people arriving at the same time, you, you feel like there's some kind of vibrancy just from being surrounded by people. Um, but if you arrive in the car by yourself and you have to park 10 minutes away and walk by yourself, um, you know, like the feeling is completely different. So I think it's, you know, it's really important uh, to think about how we move people and um, more that we can move people on bikes and, and public transport the more vibrant our cities can feel. Cool, and um, I think one of the keys to the, the vibrant city, and we've been talking about it for ages, right, is the, that really difficult thing of getting people living in the CBD. And there's a pile of reasons that people may not have chosen to come back into the CBD to live to start with after the earthquakes. Some of it is the, the style of building that we're not really used to in Christchurch because we've had this wall in our own individual sections for so long because cars have been easy. People aren't used to that more intensive living style. Um, but what we've got at the moment, right now, is this amazing opportunity with tens of thousands of Kiwis wanting to come back home who are used to busy city living in apartments and with no car. And so there's a real opportunity to try and capture those people coming back from overseas and saying, hey, Christchurch is your place. Right? We've got this amazing CBD that's being rebuilt. We're close to the Port Hills, to the Alps, to the beaches. We've got all of this amazing stuff for you to come and um, experience and live and share our city. And we've got a stack of um, those more intensive developments that have been built and some are, some are sold, some are being lived in, but there's more of them on their way. And um, there will be more and more with the new NPS and stuff like that as well, um, which is pretty cool. When it comes to the parking and the use of land, I think we need to get more people used to that off-street parking, which big cities around the country and, and, and the world do. 
Um, and the key one that just sticks me every time, people, I don't know, people go, oh, you know, but on-street parking, and I'm like, Riverside. You know, I don't know if you've seen the before and after photos of Oxford Terrace. Um, we were at our meetings today. But um, a really, really clear example of what Oxford Terrace used to be like, a nice wide footpath, two lanes of traffic, and then lots of vacant parking next to the river there. And what it's like now outside Riverside. They built Riverside in a place with no on-street parking, deliberately, um, and all of the all of the key areas now in the city that are pedestrian friendly, so Cashel Mall, Oxford Terrace, New Regents, through all those areas, have the highest pedestrian count, have the highest retail and hospitality spends. Um, and yet, you try and take a couple of car parks away on High Street so that you can make it like that for the, for the shops, the world's ending. Um, anyway, don't put that one up online. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just really wanted to emphasise that what Sarah's saying that you know the vibrancy of of these city spaces is linked to the people, and and bringing people in is not just a case of bringing them in daily from where they live. It's encouraging them to live in a space and make it their own. Um, on a personal note, I'm two weeks away from moving into an apartment. Um, it's actually on the train line as you head west out of Auckland in Mount Albert, and it's going to have. Um, something, I think it's 30 apartments, there's no car parks, there's 60 odd bike parks um, and two shared city hop cars that are electric. And I sort of, I'm moving in with my partner and we sort of went through that process of, it's not just the appeal of those sorts of um, spaces in terms of walkability and close to public transport. Um, it's also the housing, the quality of the housing stock. And so these new builds that we can do, when you have that sort of density, you're able to provide much better spec homes. It's the first time I've lived in a house in New Zealand that has been built since 1980. And the repercussions in terms of coldness and dampness and you know, the things that you experience, uh, just it's just going to be amazing. I'm really looking forward to it. <laughs> and a lot less dust, can I um, guarantee you, Ed. Yeah. Um, just, just commenting on um, Charlotte's comment about it, getting on a bus and, and everyone arriving at once. If you use the cycle lane on Strickland Street and take your street in the morning, that's what it feels like. You know, there's 20 people at every, at every light. And it, you know, it's amazing that you feel that there's a group of you going going somewhere together. So, yeah. Right, so we've got a couple of questions. We've got... Let's see that um, I've got a couple of comments and a couple of very specific questions. Um, broadening out from the CBD, uh, Catherine and I are working out at Lincoln University. Our big challenge to try and encourage more sustainable transport is that 85% of students and staff drive themselves out to Lincoln and Lincoln markets itself. And don't tell anybody at Lincoln that I said this tonight. But they market themselves as, oh, come to Lincoln, free parking, you know, and all the rest of it, get a car, you know, freedom, all the rest of it. The sort of old thinking. So we've got a big battle on our chair, on our hands. I mean, all credit to Lincoln, they're going to get rid of the coal burner by 2023, and they are talking about more sustainability. But on the transport front, we've got big challenges. We're burning a million litres of fossil fuel every year just to get us out there. On the working from home front, I think, you know, flexible working, I think work a day or two at home, you know, to reduce your commute, and then you can find a balance between the two things. But I want to come up with a couple of very practical solutions that we could do that would help our students at Lincoln, the staff at Lincoln, to actually start commuting more on the bus, or maybe on the bike, or whatever. Um, and one of them is I usually take my electric bike from St. Martin's out to Lincoln, 25k each way, 50 kilometres. Sounds amazing for an old fellow with osteoarthritis and all the rest of it. But actually it takes 45 minutes on the electric bike. If I go by car it takes 30 minutes and then it takes me 5 minutes to hobble from the car park to my office. So it's only 10 minutes longer. So, you know, I mean, I, Catherine's converted me to electric bikes. Yeah, when it's pouring with rain, I go on the bus with a good book, 
three hours return commute, but who cares, you know, I get all that reading done. But here are the practical solutions here, because I don't want to take up the whole evening. One, when I get the bus after nine o'clock, I see all the people, even older than me, because I still, despite uh, the fact I might look like it, don't qualify for a gold card. But if I was a couple of years older, I'd get the gold card. I could travel free on the buses from nine to three. Fantastic. What about a silver card for the students, 18 to 24? Half price, child fare, you don't need to change anything. Silver card, and not just Christchurch Christ could trial it, take it nationwide. You know, you, there's a chance that with this election going, you know, you might have a sympathetic national government. That's practical suggestion number one. Please talk about it with your friends. Let's, you know, I'll write a letter to the press and, you know, keep that one going. Um, practical suggestion number two, I think it's fantastic you have these free days of public transport. Do some more of those. We can say to our students, look, hey, jump on the bus. Go from Lincoln out to Littleton. Jump on the ferry. Maybe you can charge $5, because otherwise the queues are too long on the ferry if it's free. But, you know, you can go to Diamond Harbour for five bucks and, you know, explore the area of public transport. That will actually introduce young people to the fact, yes, you don't have to have your own car. You know, rent an electric car if you want it. Anyway, I've said enough. You've got the idea. So we're just going to keep in with the you want to respond to him a bit? Okay, so um, there has been a lot of investigation in this last term of government into an idea very similar to what you uh, describe, but it's called the green card, not the silver card. Um, you might have something to do with uh, the investigation into it, I, I'll, I'll be careful what I say because I was involved in, in the project and but I'm being careful what is publicly known as it was in the coalition, not the coalition, the confidence and supply agreement that it would be investigated, the Green Party's confidence and supply agreement with Labour that a green card would be investigated, that has happened. Uh, uh, it has not yet been funded it seems, but if you Google green card online you can find out a certain amount about it because I did this recently for another reason. So um, you can read up on, on, on this investigation. It was uh, primarily focused on tertiary students and folk who have a community services card, the investigation. So who knows what might happen in the next term of government depending on who's elected. Uh, to your second question, free days. We have done, um, obviously it was free stuff uh, over the COVID period. Uh, we have done some free uh, days in the last couple years around World Car Free Day. We've only done those on a Saturday and Sunday, very purposely, because uh, the weekday capacity, uh, if we made it free, probably couldn't actually cope uh, with the, the volumes. And we're very conscious that we don't want people to have a negative experience, and we don't want our regular customers to be regular, uh, to be negatively impacted if the bus that's normally in space is too full. So we're, we're conscious of that, so the idea is good in principle, but you wouldn't want to do something that, that did, uh, makes a negative experience for your regulars or puts people off in their first experience. Just um, one of the things is that when students shift from high school to university, it's a really big thing and they get all grown up and a lot of them want to buy a car. So the, at that point, often when they're trying to be a bit more independent and stuff as well, the price point is really important to so that, that green card for the free travel. But the other thing is ECAN has a fair review coming up um, in the next year, and so making sure that you have input into that, because even, oh, we're a bit here, you know what I'm about to say, don't you? Raising the, raising the student age, so it currently captures uh, 18, up to 18, so 17 year olds. When you turn 18, all of a sudden you're an adult fair. So if you're able to raise that, because there are actually some students who turn 18 while they're still at um, high school, but if you're able to raise that a year or two, you hopefully through that financial incentive get people used to travelling the bus out to Lincoln and those kind of things. Couldn't you raise at that, that point, <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't that be fantastic? But yeah, so so but getting students at Lincoln involved in the fair review process as that happens and finding out about that would be really good. Okay. Um, okay. I only got time um, for one question and. Um, Person 
So when I moved here, I opened a bike shop. I thought it would be for transport cycling. Uh, so it didn't work. Uh, I was in Palmerston North and everyone thought that cycling was for sport. And if you look at Trade Me, bicycles are under sports gear. So Charlotte, um, how do we um, change the language? You've, you've mentioned that already. You talked about language at the leadership level in terms of climate change and such. But how do we get people to stop thinking about cycling as a recreational activity? I mean, I know the helmet law makes it look like it's something that, that you have to be a, a sporty person to do. But what do you think? It's not just for Charlotte. Anybody can answer that one. Um, well, again, I think it comes down to language that comes from the top. Um, you know, the government doesn't really talk too much about biking as a mode of transport. Therefore, the bicycle industry does not respond because there's no market demand for uh, bikes as, uh, for commuter bikes or commuter accessories. Um, therefore, they, they don't want to take the risk of selling that product when they expect that no one's going to buy it. So, um, what did what, it, what do we do differently? Um, I guess that the whole, the whole idea for the shop, for our shop, is that it's more of a, it's more of a lifestyle store. Like it has some visual sensibility, um, like we cater to a certain type of person. Like I think if you took all of our product and put it in the store, uh, I don't know, like uh, Evo cycles, for example, would it work? Probably not. <laughs> People come to shop at our store because it's different, I guess. And yeah, maybe that's why. And I think until until people until the the language changes and um, people start talking about bikes as mode of transport. Um, yeah, the rest of the bicycle industry probably won't, won't respond. It's been really interesting over the last couple of years finding a whole pile of people who are recreational cyclists who it's never occurred to them to bike as a commuting activity. And um, it was at the Asia Pacific Cycling Congress a couple of years ago. We listened to Sarah Olma talk about her cycling experiences and she, you know, top international cyclist, never cycle commuted until she had kids, until she retired from racing. And it never occurred to her to use as a bike, a bike as transport. And there are so many people up on the Port Hills, on their mountain bikes, those kind of things, who, who just don't bike to work. And yet if they, they have a bike, but clearly fit enough. Um, and it just doesn't occur to them. So how we switch that? Um, because there's enormous potential there. So. Um, and also, again, um, yeah, when, they, when these people, kind of people do go into bike run, for example, to buy a commuter bike, most likely they'll be sold a mountain bike or a road bike and then they find it really uncomfortable um, to ride and they're completely put off by the idea. So, um, so yeah, selling the right product is, is important as well. This is a question. So my memory, and things might have changed, but the way that we measure cycle use is by commuting cycling so the data measures the percentage of people biking to work and that's what the census does and that's what various council surveys does so it just seems that we're discussing cycling as a transport but our measure of cycle use is, is people using it as transport so One of the best things that you did in shop is giving a service for bike, your bike can put service, and that for me was really important. I tried to get my bike serviced at another bike shop at Tower Junction at some point on my way to work at Canterbury, and got in the morning, dropped her up and said, well, when will it be ready? Because I need to decide whether I'm going to wait for an hour here or get the bus to work and come back and then, oh, we can't tell you. So I got the bus to work, they said it would probably be the end of the day. And then they said, oh, it's ready now. <laughs> Half an hour later, I could have just waited. Um, and then they're not in the mindset of realizing that people are using the bike to actually get somewhere. It's just uh, they assume you've given it to shop to get your bike. So I'm just going back and so pick up another bike on my way home. I think that recognition is one of the most important.
active, so I went through a, a bad spell of punctures, and I would get to get, walk walk the bike the last 500 metres to work, and then take off my tyre and take the shower and Ken and <laughs> come pick it up at the end of the day bike park. So. <laughs> Do you want to add anything, Ed? Um, just, just one thing, and that, and that I, you know, I do, do think language is extremely important in the way that we we talk about cycling. But also that e-bikes, I think, are the fastest growing vehicles sales in New Zealand, and they enable um, people who wouldn't necessarily cycle to cycle, even with our infrastructure the way it is. So, and those people tend to be older or otherwise less likely to cycle. So convincing people that they can do these sorts of things and convincing older people that it's easy and they're able, they're able to cycle because they have an e-bike, that's also a really powerful thing. Um, that's going to create a huge groundswell of demand for better cycle facilities and stuff like that. Just add one very last thing, sorry. Um, just one last thing on the, the measuring the, the trips and how we tend to talk about the commuting ones, but they you know that's six or seven key bits into the city and are raising 20% on a year, that kind of thing. But actually when we did our qualitative stuff a couple of years back, 51% um, of people on the cycleway were doing it for train for commuting, and the other 49% were doing other stuff. And when you look at the different ways that, um, and, and we had 41% female as well in the, in the very latest stuff, which is way above the, the national average, which is fantastic. But women often use it um, in different ways, to be less of the commuting, more of the chain kind of stuff, which doesn't necessarily come to town. But we do have that network across the city of the counters and all of that stuff on SmartView, which is just phenomenal for, for counting the trips. So. And John, it's not that you were doing anything wrong, you're just way ahead of your time. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I, I, we've all finished, and if you want to stay on and socialise and keep eating food, because I'm sure there's more drink and drink. Um, I, I really, um, I, I was going to ask people to sum up, um, and I'd rather you did it than me. So have you got a, a couple of sentences without long speeches of, of just summing up maybe the, the what now, you know, what, what can we do differently after leaving tonight? I mean, I, I know that sounds like we're, you know, it's a proselytising session, but um, if you could just, you know, just give, give a bit of a message. So we'll start with Ed at the top. Um, yeah, it's it's a challenging thing. I, I think um, my main message there would have to be uh, recognising and remembering the experience that we all had during lockdown and then making sure that we're communicating that, not, not through official channels necessarily, but it can be to friends and family and discussing these sorts of things because the more people hear it, the more situations people hear it, uh, you know, this is just going to add to and reinforce those desires for what people want. So I think it's just a matter of talking and communicating these things, just in informal settings and formal settings, just keep talking about it. I think uh, for me, recognising COVID is a disruptor and actually acting on that and not just going back to business as usual. So I talked about how um, public transport volumes might be less because people are taking different options in terms of flexible working. Hopefully that means there's a disruptor. We don't need to go and build a whole lot of roads that we might have needed to otherwise build. And that maybe we can spend some of that money and invest it into active loads and public transport instead and use it as an opportunity to encourage step change in our public transport rather than, uh, sorry, in our transport. Because we have a couple of meals in it. Um, and uh, not go back to the way things were. Uh, it's very easy to fall back to the way things were. And we've already had a big disruptor or two in Christchurch over the last 10 years, but as a country, uh, let's try and harness this rather than uh, falling back to where we were. Um, for me, it's just about keeping the momentum going. Um, and yeah, just keep riding your bike and if you are one of those people that has decided since lockdown you might need another bike, or you know, <laughs> of your friends who are thinking, um, yeah, I like to bike so much, I need, I need to buy a bike, tell them to get onto it because there's going to be a serious uh, shortage and delay of <laughs> bikes and bike parts. Um, yeah. Uh, 
because of the mass amount of sales across the world. Yeah, I know that, uh, for example, today I heard that Shimano has a one year wait on some of their, uh, their parts. I guess for me, it's um, recognising that we're on the space, that we, we know it, there's lots of research out there, all of the data, the stats and stuff is there. Now that we've got the the um, the eyes on the prize, we've got the real life examples where people have seen the difference that it can make, they have seen families biking on the streets. The thing to do is, I mean, we've got all the transport planners and the people who know how to do this stuff in the world, we need the decision makers to make the decisions. We need the decision makers to say, yes, they need to put it on the budgets, they need to direct the, the staff to put it in the LTP, all of that kind of stuff that needs to happen at the election. You need to vote and you need to submit on everything all the time and get your friends to do it because um, pushing your elected officials, whether at local council or at government, makes a difference. And I see it almost every day. Um, writing to the newspapers, all of those kind of things, change the narrative, it makes a difference and it would help enormously. Um, I guess I think we can just be encouraged by the fact that we're here and having these conversations and that means that we've learned a lot and we know that other people have had the same experiences and there's lots that, there's lots that can be learned and we can feel like there's lots to continue to have these conversations and it's kind of given us a renewed energy and that's the things that we all know that we wanted to achieve anyway. And as I started with really, I think we can be hopeful that we can come together and prioritise the needs of society over individuals and the needs of um, health and well-being and environment over the economy when we need to, and that should give us hope for lots of other global challenges as well. And just before I hand back to Grace, just a couple of things from me. One around the language, I think that the most um, Depressing language, I suppose, we've had in, in the response and recovery is shovel ready. Um, I, I think it's meant we've been constructing, wanting to construct things. After the earthquakes, it made sense that we did infrastructure repairs and we did shovel ready projects, but we had no damage to our infrastructure through COVID. So it just seems that we've got, it's taken us off onto a track of building things um, when we could have been investing in people and health and housing and community and, and active transport. Um, provisions. So I think that, that use of that language has been has, has really sent us in a direction that I don't think we should have gone. Um, and then the other thing that people talked about was that people were cycling because it felt safe when they were, went during lockdown. Um, and the way I feel when I'm biking on the off-road cycle, or the, the separated cycle pass, I feel safe. So somehow we've got to get people who haven't been used to using those routes and just go the same route that they always drive, which possibly isn't safe. We need to get some way of um, showing those people that those routes and, and getting them to go off path a little or off route a little bit to use those what much safer paths. And I know people do that, you know, there's, there's schemes where people friend, friend another person and take them in, but I think that's something something we need to do a lot more. And, and Andrew, I think your comments about the health benefits of a lot of the things that happen, but I think is a real take home for many of us. So thank you very much, Angela, Ed, um, Sarah, Ka Charlotte, <laughs> so, and Edward. Um, I've really, really enjoyed it, and my trepidation this morning is, is, was not warranted, so thank you. Thank you, Grace. <laughs> Thank you, Chrissy, and thanks to all five of our panelists. Um, I had quite a few light bulb moments as you were talking, and just things I know that I'm going to take forward and keep talking about, I think, whether it's online or in person. So these are conversations that have to be had, and they have to be had sooner rather than later, and they have to be had with some boldness and rigour. And the point about the election <laughs> impending um, is obviously very poignant as well. Time is of the essence, of course, and um, we did scramble to even have this event. We wondered if we'd miss the mark if we were too late. And, um, yeah, so I'm still glad we had it. <laughs> so thanks again um, for making your flowers available. Um, this is going to also be, as it looks, going to be recorded and will be available online, so the audience is far broader than um, those in this room. So thank you again. Um, we did have a little bit of a, a quick prize left. We didn't tell you this, um, just to put, put the pressure on you, but um, we have an audience prize for the, the best question. Um, and I think hands down it has to go through 
to you, gentlemen, over there, um, with all your passion um, and your ideas as well, offering solutions. So thank you. Um, it's a, yeah, it's a good well. Thank you. Um, and we also have um, something for, for all of our panellists, and obviously yourself, Chris, here too, and um, we have a digital version that will be coming your way, <laughs> so you have certainly not missed out at all. Um, just a, a Scorpio Books um, voucher to get yourself something fun, obviously, if you done something to read. <laughs> so thanks again, please please do stay around. We um, obviously have plenty um, still to eat and drink. Um, no, no, no rush to get out of here. Um, and thanks again. Thank you.